Our scripture reading this morning comes from the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. I invite you to follow along with me in your pew Bible. You can find it on page 1014. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that, when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of this, his holy word. Let's pray. Gracious God, may the scripture that's read and revealed to us today be heard by discernible ears. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we begin our lesson today, we need to remember that we're still in this Sabbath day that began three chapters ago in chapter 14. We're spending a Sabbath day with Jesus, and it's a pretty eventful day that began in the house of the Pharisee at dinner where Jesus was invited along with a man who had dropsy, and the Pharisees watched Jesus to see if he would heal this man on the Sabbath day. We know that Jesus did that, and then he lectured them about being invited guests and how they should accept invitations and where they should sit, and then he went out into the streets and the crowd followed him there. That same day Jesus later was eating with some of the tax collectors, sinners as the Pharisees called them, and the Pharisees found fault with that. They said, oh, this man receives sinners and he eats with them. And and again, I know I said this either last week or two weeks ago, maybe both weeks, but I'm glad that that accusation of Jesus made by the Pharisees is true because I'm glad to know that he does receive sinners Thank God he received this sinner, and I thank God that I can have the most intimate fellowship with God, with Jesus Christ, by eating with him, inviting him into the mealtime. 
Jesus then gave a series of stories that compiled one big parable, and it, had came, and it comes in three parts, two of which we heard about last Sunday. They dealt with lost things and the natural response to finding that which was lost. The shepherd who had, the lost, had lost one sheep and searched until he found it and came rejoicing and inviting his friends to receive him for, to help rejoice with him for finding the sheep that was lost. And Jesus declares that rejoicing and the joy that goes on in heaven when a lost soul is found. The second was the lost coin and the widowed woman who sweeps and searches her house until she finds a coin and she calls her neighbor and says, rejoice that I have found my lost coin. And then she shares how there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents than many who don't need to repent. Somebody texted me last Sunday afternoon that they had found a lost sock in their laundry and she said, I think it would be crazy if I called my family and asked them to come and rejoice with me, but maybe not whose sock it was, right? They're probably happy. Instead of going with one sock, they now had two. So, Then there's the prodigal son story, which we did not hear about last week, but who has taken this inheritance and gone to a far country and wasted his inheritance on scandalous living. He gets down to nothing. He spends all his money and he takes a job feeding pigs. And during that time of feeding pigs, he comes to the conclusion that the pigs are eating better than he is. So he, goes, he decides to go back home to his father because he is literally starving. And he says to himself, maybe if I work as my dad's servant, I will live better than the way I'm living now. I'm going to go home and I'm going to say to my dad, Dad, I don't deserve to be called your son anymore. I've blown it. I've blown my inheritance. And I recognize that. But I'd still like to work for you as a servant. I'd like to be one of your servants. So he decides to go home. And when he does, he is yet a far way off. And no doubt his father has been watching for him. And his father saw him coming. So the father runs out to meet him. And just as, the, just as he greets the son, the son is about ready to give his little speech that he has prepared to his dad. And he, his dad was, interrupts him and he says to the servants, kill the fatted calf. Let's have a party. Put the rings on his fingers, for my son was lost, and now he is found. So our passage this morning directly follows this story of the prodigal son. And here in our passage today, it begins with Jesus addressing this discussion and he's addressing it only to his disciples. However, we know by the context that it is overheard by others. But it is specifically directed to his disciples. He tells them a story about a rich man who had a house manager. And a house manager, of course, is a person who cares for the financial activities of a family a family who had a lot of commerce happening within the household as well as outside the walls of the household. As the story continues, Jesus tells us that there are charges brought against this house manager, that he was wasting the owner's possessions. So this manager, and we are told, we're not told exactly what he was doing wrong, we're not told what deemed him unfaithful in his work. We don't know if it was him embezzling money for his own personal profit or whether he had just made bad investments. What we do know is in verse 2 it says, The owner called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. Well, the manager says to himself, well, now what shall I do? 
My master is taking away my job. And the important thing to know here is he's already lost his job. The master's not taking it away, but he still has power. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. When I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. See that goofy thinking? So this man decides what to do. So that when he's removed as manager in the position of this house, other masters will receive him into their, their houses. And again, if you have somebody, if you know somebody's cheating on somebody's, why would you hire them? Is my sort of question. But he calls the debtors of the man that he works for now. And he says to them individually, and he asks them how much they owe the master. Maybe that's the problem, right? He doesn't even know how much the people owe him. And I'm just going to use round figures for these examples. The first one says, 100 units of oil. And the manager quickly says, make it 50. It's 50% discount, folks. The next one, he calls and they say, oh, I owe 100 units of wheat. And this manager tells him to make it 80. Again, a 20% discount. Now we see what's going on here, don't we? This manager is renegotiating the terms of these contracts that his master had with these individual debtors in order to carry some kind of favor for himself with those debtors so that they would feel obligated to help him when he loses his current position, which already has happened in verse 2 because it says, because you cannot be manager any longer. He's no longer manager. Just a quick note here. In the commentaries, there's a lot of specula speculation on how the manager could do this, how he could give them a 50% discount and then a 20% discount. And almost all of the commentaries really believe that it was his commission that he removed. And if it was his commission, if it was his money that he gave away, it does sort of make sense. Because in verse 8, the master of the house commends the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. In verse 8 it says, For the people of this world are shrewder in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. Now we need to pause here for a second. Because verse 8 is the theme of what Jesus is pointing to. The story is not to appeal or applaud dishonesty, nor the underhanded practices or the devious business practices of the manager, but instead it is to show how witty this manager is in using the resources that were available to him at the time. Sometimes unbelievers, people who don't know the Lord, often are wiser in the way that they use what they have been given than are the children of God. This passage is about stewardship, folks. This is about figuring out and using what the Lord has given us for His purposes. This is reminding us to think ahead to use what we've been given for spiritual purposes. In other words, we need to invest in heavenly things. We have to use our earthly resources to invest in heavenly rewards. That's the focus of this passage. That's the point of the entire thing. The world has certainly crept into the church's thinking. And if you don't believe me, think about what you hear out there. We are constantly being reminded to think about our retirement. We need to put money away for our retirement. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Please don't get me wrong. Don't leave here thinking that I said don't put money away for your retirement. The trouble starts when, we th when thinking starts to take over the way that we think about our financial resources. We plan for our retirement and we begin to think like the world does. We tend to forget that as Christians, we believe that our life doesn't come to an end here. You ever hear of everlasting life? Life everlasting? This passage is reminding us to invest in the things here on earth that are going to pay dividends into, for us into eternity. 
shrewdness with our money and wealth will not get us into heaven. It is only with the grace of God through Jesus Christ that we gain eternal life. Have we been faithful stewards with the gift that God, with the gifts that God has given us? I believe this passage is indicating that we have been unfaithful stewards. We probably deserve to be fired. But Jesus has paid our debts. Not just some of them, but all of them. Paid in full. Your bill has been paid off and removed from the books by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. No dishonesty involved. Just as Paul reminds Timothy, in the book of Timothy, it says, There is one mediator, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all. This is exactly why we need to be good stewards of our possessions, our money, our spiritual gifts that God has blessed each one of us with. How we handle, how we manage how we maximize our income and assets is where the shrewdness of this passage becomes wisdom. People come to faith in Jesus Christ through the ministry of us sharing the gospel message. Many times it is done through the ministry of your giving to this church. Maybe it's through the ministry of Vacation Bible School. Maybe it's, through the mission, maybe it's through the ministry of a mission trip. Maybe the gospel message is shared over a cup of coffee or an ice cream cone or four cookies or two cookies. Maybe it's through the support of Operation Christmas Child where the box that you pack up with your children ends up enlightening some child's heart in a faraway land that never would have heard of Jesus' love without you and your family and his and sharing his love with that child. Those, my friends, are the people who come to faith in Christ through the ministry of the gospel message and who one day may help welcome us into etern the eternal dwellings in our passage, verses 10 through 12, it says, Whoever can be trusted with little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy with handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will you give, who will... Who will give you property of your own? You know, every time I read this passage, I think that every politician who is voted into office should have to read and understand these verses before taking office. Because that's what we empower them to do. We entrust them to use our tax dollars wisely. It's a good reminder that all our earthly wealth is God-given. And if we fail to use it wisely, how are we going to be entrusted to handle true wealth? If there has not been an investment made for the, for the eternal, then we are not being faithful with what God has graciously giving to, given to us. It is an important message that Jesus is communicating with us here about how to use our resources. He is telling us not to fixate on money because when we do that, it becomes our master. And we can't serve two masters. It's fine to plan ahead for your retirement, but also plan ahead 
for eternity. Because life as we know it doesn't end here on earth. So use what God has given you with eternity in mind. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, again, we give you thanks for the gifts that you have bestowed upon each one of us. May, you, may we use those gifts wisely in your service, Lord. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.